Good morning, everyone. I hope I, I will not awake you today. Today is the last day of the conference, so those of you who have been sleeping, please keep on sleeping. Uh, today I would like to approach a very, uh, very problematic uh, topic. And I'll start slowly, but at the end, please do not be scared with my presentation. So, as you know, when it works, yes, uh, there is a mismatch between engineering education and the industry demands. Basically, we are talking uh, about having too much on teaching of theory and too little on laying foundation for practice in design. And this is clearly a problem that we have globally. This uh, uh, actually generates a tension between two needs of education, the need for specialists and, of course, the need for generalists. And this, uh, this stress that we have is creating more and more problems in terms of our education. Actually, it's generating some mismatch and which is, uh, by, the, by the end, creating a uh, high unemployability rate. So although everyone will tell you we need more engineers, uh, there are still a lot of engineers which are unemployed around the world. And this is clearly a huge problem that we need to be facing. Basically, because a lot of uh, institutions did not yet understood the new paradigm of engineering. We used to have a narrow definition. An engineer would get specifications and will deliver prototypes. Now, more and more, we need an engineer to be able to understand the people, the problem which they have, the concept which is behind that problem, and therefore uh, allowing him to generate the prototype which will lead to a product and to a market. So the engineer is no longer someone which is dumb enough to create anything. He needs to understand the full context, and this is generating a huge change in our society. So it's very common that you listen to a lot of people saying that the general skills that the uh, engineers need, besides engineering uh, reasoning, it, there are personal skills, uh, professional skills, teamwork, communication. All of this started to become major uh, in terms of engineering education. And of course, this is already well known. Not, what I probably might not know is that the skills itself are now changing. From 2015 to 2020, we saw four of those skills really rising a lot. One of the first one was critical thinking. Uh, the other one was creativity, emotional intelligence, and cognitive flexibility. Those four skills are now being more thought of than they used to be before. And why is that? Basically, because the companies uh, really understand the new paradigm, and they don't want people which are just able to communicate without saying anything relevant, which are even able to speak other languages, but they have no contents to say, to spoken on those languages. So there is a, a huge change on the first approach that you need some personal skills. So what does it mean for universities, this change? Well, it means a lot. The first thing actually it means is that we need to reorganize the curricula. And we need to reorganize the curricula around uh, designing building test projects. We need, to, we need to redesign the curricula completely, considering in terms of societal and environmental concerns. The SDGs are nowadays one of the topics which are most transversal to all the academia. More than that, we need to have and featuring active and experimental learning. And this is, again, another one of the changes, the big changes that we're experiencing in academia. So the 21st century curricula, it's a mix between three uh, new uh, strong pushovers. The first one is creativity and collaborative design thinking. First, we need to be creative. We need the students to be creative. The second one is innovation and entrepreneurial thinking. They need to think about the full product cycle into the market. And the third one is rigorous engineering. We do need people who understand the concepts and the basis of engineers and act upon it. With all of that, we start a new buzzword, which is interdisciplinary thinking. A lot of people are pushing into interdisciplinary thinking precisely because of that. 
as you cannot see at this moment, uh, it is <laughs> the mix of those three uh, pushovers that will generate the 21st century curricula, which you can see is quite a dark scenario, what you see in front, okay. Eventually, it will come out. But anyway, so uh, we need to know how to organize uh, the engineering degrees. And this is a, a key task. So we need to understand how can it be done. So we ourselves in Polytechno of Porto, we took an approach which has three steps. The first one is to understand that we need to have common engineering languages. What are the common engineering languages? Uh, well, the second one is to profiling what kind of engineer that we need, and the third is generate the apps. So what are the common engineering languages? Mathematics, you need that as a universal language, of course. Uh, I think MATLAB, MATLAB is really enjoying my presentation, go following up that one, <laughs> uh, which is one of the, the common languages. Digital literacy, algorithmic thinking is a must nowadays. We also seen one of the, uh, the previous keynotes stressing that precisely the same point. We need design skills, academic communication, engineering ethics, more and more this is key in terms uh, of the common world that we have today. Uh, and we have collaborative interdisciplinary teamwork as one of, of the other languages. So all of those are common languages that we need to push over in terms of having in a new degree. The second, regardless of the, the specific engineering discipline, we need to profile the disciplinary uh, approach. That means we need to decide what kind of engineers are we producing because not all engineers are born the same. So the first one, which I appro approach to you and I'll show you, they are the researcher, which is a experimental and knowledge discovery. This is an engineer which does a lot of research work and is, uh, is not just a pure researcher because he also has to do engineering, but he has a focus on that uh, specific point. The second one is the system designer the one who thinks about the system, who actually conceives and engineering the systems. This is a different kind of engineer with different kind of aspects and needs. The third one is the device uh, designer and develop, the one which is going to design specific devices which are needed to support specific systems. The fourth one is the product support engineering and operator, that that can operate uh, something specific which then allows them to uh, have a high application of their own knowledge. And the fifth and the last one is the entrepreneurial engineer, the manager, the one which is going to, uh, uh, going to uh, raise the business and understand the business performance. All of those five are engineers. And a lot of times when you talk about I need an engineer in the market, you probably just need one or two of those, not the five at the same time. The problem is that the, 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 the name itself generates a, a huge uh, problem in terms of perception. People think about it, well, you need an engineer, but what kind of engineer? So understanding exactly what kind of engineers you want to generate, you want to create, is something specific to the degree. And this is something that you need to understand. This does not mean that you will not allow a proper engineer, as we say, graduated, or eventually move into one place or to the other. Now, it is impossible to try to give them all the necessary skills and even skills to raise uh, later on in all these five uh, directions. It is a limited time, it is a limited uh, group of options. So you have to decide what kind of engineers you really require. The third one, you need to create hubs, which have pockets of interdisciplinarity. So you need to make sure that you have a physical location on the campus, which is around uh, and usable, which can manage our topics without needing uh, to change the full curricula. You all know what is the, the mass to try to, uh, to change uh, anything in the curricula. But if you have a place where you can use as an incubator of ideas, of practices, of uh, of theories, whatever you want, actually it helps a lot. And this part of thing will help in terms of interdisciplinary collaborative teams as well. So in Porto, in Porto Polytechnic, we did create a, such a place. It's called PDF, Porto Design Factory. 
and it is a place, a physical place, it happens to be an old building we reshaped uh, into proper uh, new, uh, <coughs> new usage. Uh, it is a place where you can actually experiment in terms of what we need and what we want in terms of this new engineering. This is one of the classes, as you can see, there are no seats into that. Basically, you just sit in some poofs and that's it. So basically, we took, it was, it was cost and time ex uh, uh, expensive. It took us uh, a huge amount of money. I'm not going to disclose how much, but it, it we're able to really generate something which will now allow us uh, to push forward. It's been running now for a couple of years, and we hope that uh, from here we generate the new kind of engineer that we want uh, in Porto Polytechnic. So we had the vision from our engineers, the Porto Polytechnic vision for our students, which they should know the fundamentals, they should know how to handle algorithms. They have the systems thinkings. They'll be able to share their own knowledge. And they have a lot of uh, uh, concepts and skills which are inherent to them. Things like soft skills, like curiosity itself. Uh, and that's what we want to do. So this is how we decided to make the, the, the change. And this change, in, so far, it sounds quite, well, it can take a while, it can be bothersome, it might have some problems, but it's nothing too scary. Then, when we look into the students, are the STEM students actually different today? And we did find they are. Actually, we know they are more competent uh, with technology. We do know that they have shifted this size to a digital, uh, kind of uh, life itself and we know they are multitaskers in all the areas of their life so it's not just about multitasking at, w at, uh, at their own education they are multitaskers that's it and by being multitaskers that means that the, sp the students expect to have their own personalized learning and that's when the paradigm shifts actually changes a lot no longer the one size fits all kind of classroom it's the thing which they thought of. Some adjust with more or less trouble, but that's not what they want. So this change and what do they want actually led us into look a lot into what is going to happen into the future of the, the education. So we know, and this is, uh, uh, this is a fact, that personalized education is proven to produce learning gains of the average student to the order of two standard deviations. So that means if we take the time to have a personalized education to someone, it would increase uh, his ability to uh, be successful and to be able to produce more, to be better integrated and to be better into the society. So that's a fact. Now, the way in which we do it that's the complication. Because it's well known what the society expects us to, uh, to train uh, the engineers. So engineers, educators are expected to behave like this. If it worked, I would be happy. So it's nice, the sound especially. So basically what is saying, this is a part from, you know, the movie Matrix, where she wants to learn how to fly uh, an helicopter. And she calls the engineer and said, I need to learn how to fly an helicopter. And she said, he says, right away. Then it took like five seconds and still is, is, there, is being speed up and saying, please, r hurry. So the, the idea that you're going to be, have this education, uh, it is something that, it is the difference between having uh, a normal education or some education which should exist like this. So the market, the society, does not want us to take too long. Uh, not even the students want us to take too long. We want to be just in time. So. So it doesn't work. Let's try again. We move to the next one. So we are moving to an era of artificial intelligent educators. 
And this is, can be quite scary. Why can it be scary? Because, well, the majority of the people in this room are educators, right? And we are not artificial intelligent driven. So, we are moving into a situation, and this is an experiment some of you might have followed in Georgia Tech, the technical assistant, Jill, which was artificial intelligence, and she was supporting in parallel with other human uh, teaching assistants. And he was actually rated the best teaching assistant uh, around in Georgia Tech that, that semester. And it was basically an artificial intelligent beam. So that means that even the students somehow tend to prefer more artificial intelligent beings in terms of having their own education instead of the boring human professors like we are. And that's again started to create something that looks, enters into the sci-fi. But we already passed that stage. In the August uh, of 2016, a small company started in Stockholm, Sina Labs. Some of you might have heard about it. It's quite young, it's just a small one, which actually has the potential of being a unicorn. For those which are in the business uh, lingo, it's about one of the companies which will get $1 billion uh, in the next three to five years. And is actually moving completely the design paradigm of education. It is moving and is revolutionizing a six trillion education industry, generating what is called artificial intelligent instructors. And that change itself, it will have an impact, a huge impact. A lot of people are putting money into it and it's creating something which is uh, amazing into the results, but very scary in its consequences. So how does it work? Basically, they understood that two, no two people learn in the same way. So it measures the student's response time, the, it measures the student's answers, the contextual information. It understands uh, how they best learn and how do they really do not learn. They compute all of that in terms of artificial intelligence and at the end they generate the right professor for that specific student which will push him enough to learn but not too much in order to lose him or not too little in order to get him an interest which is the dream professor itself. It will generate an individual professor which is the best for the person itself depending on the time, on the age and so on. And actually it gets better and better while it gets more information coming uh, from other education process, from other education uh, teachers, uh, from everything around the world. So it is uh, scary enough. But okay, it's just a company, it's just an idea. It raised already some million uh, euros but it's just a company. The problem is we start to see the changes. And the politicians are endorsing this transformation. This was three weeks ago uh, in France. The, president, uh, the French president saying precisely uh, during his speech during Artificial Intelligence for Humanity that he is the one who wants to be on the race of generating this kind of artificial intelligent educators. So France is putting all this weight onto that. A lot of companies are also doing the same thing. So we have all these melting pots. We have someone who wants it. We have someone who is able to do it. We have the political endorsement and we have enough money to do it. So that's when we can start to be scared because we are starting to think about what is going to be the future. Remember, this gentleman actually appeared because somehow during the revolution, uh, all of those things will align, the technical, the needs, the knowledge, the politicians, and generate uh, this, uh, this person here. So let's understand a little bit more before we keep just, be, just stay scared about it. Ringing the advanced personalized learning, there are several methods. I'm not going to bother you with that in here. If you want to follow up, please uh, write me back. But the idea is that there are several artificial intelligent methods which can be applied. And basically, it generates tests and gets some inference and it creates and accumulates knowledge. Uh, for those of you which are 
uh, understood some somehow artificial intelligence is should say some uh, uh, neural networks plus 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 which means that nowadays we can generate something which is very much specific topic and oriented and is no longer just learning for a specific purpose but it can accumulate a lot of knowledge and divide it in in, in small sectors so although uh, some people might argue it's impossible to incorporate all the knowledge in one single uh, structure which is correct it's not impossible to incorporate the knowledge in small clusters which are then cluster oriented all together it's like if you want to boil the ocean uh, it's impossible to boil the ocean or it's very probably impossible to boil the ocean significantly but if you take small portions of water you can boil them and then put it all together so basically that's the approach which they're using so uh, it's very objective oriented it means they want to solve something and how to solve it it takes an approach it reduces uh, reduce the project the, the problem to a simplified problem which then serves as a witness to understand and to generate the skill Basically, it's possible to incorporate all this knowledge in a new way of approaching, a new way, a new method of uh, advancing uh, our knowledge. Even the learning mechanism, uh, they, uh, they are moving more and more from the bulldozer uh, process, which are known from artificial, artificial intelligence, to the more human-like constraints, where you even get one-shot uh, learning uh, kind of process. So it's moving from the repetitive work where you go and you mimic the biology and you do pattern recognition uh, to move to explanation base and to one-shot learning. This movement is real, is happening, and nowadays as we speak, there are a lot of artificial intelligence beings being trained to be educators uh, in different topics around the world. And this will be the base of uh, the engine which will then generate a lot of uh, products. It will be, if you want, like a Google of uh, education itself, which will have then uh, be available to different platforms. Of course, the learning mechanisms do change. That means that we need to re-engineer the learning process for these new educators. It's not the same thing to actually generate knowledge as we do and to pass knowledge into a classroom like this one, which is getting extinct more and more as we speak, and to create something which is a huge approach. You've all followed probably, well, for sure, Sophia, when he did the, the presentation in Saudi Arabia. And basically, Sophia, the limitation was not about what she could do. He had to have a physical appearance and to be in a stage. That was the difficult part, which makes no sense in terms of a normal education because you do not need some physical presence in front of you, especially in the new millennium kind of generation which are connected with other interfaces. So, a brave new world is coming. We, are, we know that we have some problems and if we do not adjust, we, as we are educators, will be extinct. So this is part of the life, uh, but please do not feel like dinosaurs. Uh, we still have some time. Uh, but we started a process where this thing is going to be uh, without any coming back. So what can we do? Well, we can advocate engineering education in the context of real life situation. This is something which is still very hard for artificial intelligence to mimic real life situations are still very hard to do. So this is a niche where we are still much better than the normal one. So if you think about that professor who always give the same thing as is in the book, has no connection and so on, that one is very easy to replace by artificial intelligence instructor. Now, the one which connects with real life, that's very hard uh, to actually do still today. It'll be done, but it will take some time. The second one is we need to teach more explicitly skills such as brainstorming, critical thinking, and team working. Those are things which are not really, uh, let us say, the best environment for artificial intelligence. These kind of skills were still one of the things where we are better connected than the other ones. The third one, we need to promote integration of courses and models. When you separated each one of the models, each one of the knowledge by small uh, crunches, then again, it's very easy to replace by artificial intelligence in structure. If you mix it all together and you generate some advantage out of that, that's still very hard for currently the artificial intelligence. Of course, 
we should encourage interdisciplinary collaboration. Again, one of the things is quite hard for them to still do. And notice that I'm saying them. Now we're studying a lot like the Terminator. There's we and there's them, okay? And that's the key point into it. Uh, but uh, we should nevertheless be ready to witness the end of the conventional uh, education. Thank you very much. Thank you.